Okay, so as you know, uh, the objective of this course is to introduce you to various research directions uh, in accounting information systems. And, uh, and early in this class, uh, we're introducing you to uh, what became uh, synonymous with modeling of accounting information systems. So this topic is not a new topic anymore. Uh, as you realize, the first paper I'm going to cover uh, was published almost 40 years ago, 39 to be precise. And uh, in the time that has passed since, uh, this paper has become the foundation of modern undergraduate accounting information systems textbooks. Uh, it was not an easy going, it took a while, uh, but uh, I believe that about a decade ago, pretty much every major undergraduate accounting information system textbook uh, in the market started including the coverage of this topic. Now, uh, the appearance of this topic is credited to a single person. Uh, his name is Bill McCarthy, uh, who at the time of the publication was a young assistant professor at Michigan State University in East Lansing. Michigan, and he is still in the same school. He is now a distinguished professor. Uh, he is still active, and he is a great friend of our program. And uh, I hope that all of you will have a chance to see him in person because <clears throat> he comes to our seminar to present what he is doing uh, currently pretty often. Uh, this is the second major paper on this topic that he published. Actually, both were published in the Accounting Review. The first one was published in 1979. <clears throat> and the second one, as you see, was published in 82. So uh, what is it all about? And what necessitated uh, the creation of this new research dimension and these contributions that created uh, our modern semantic models of accounting information systems. <clears throat> now, to understand this, we have to go a little bit back in history. Uh, I assume that most of you know that electronic computers uh, appeared, roughly speaking, in the mid 1940s and became used uh, and the origins of business applications of electronic computers can be dated back to the late 1950s. Uh, it should come as no surprise that uh, by early to mid 1960s, uh, people who worked uh, on business applications, as well as some other applications in particular, realized that uh, there, there was a need for a, for a special kind of software called database management systems uh, that would serve as intermediary between regular applications uh, software and uh, conventional uh, storage file systems, which were maintained by operating systems. And there were multiple reasons for that. Uh, people wanted to have data which was independent from the applications, data that could be described outside of the application programs, which was not possible to do at that time. At that time, business applications were written in a programming language called COBOL, and the data section of that program uh, was the very first thing that you would work on where you would define the data and you would keep defining and redefining uh, the same data all over again when you wrote different applications. Uh, at the same time, uh, companies started realizing that uh, they were creating uh, this proliferation uh, of separate systems that helped them run different business processes, and that was their value, but also created some problems in the way of integration of what was happening in the enterprise. So uh, as an example, you can think of a system that supported sales uh, and had to maintain information about the customers 
And another system, which was typically uh, a separate program, usually ex executed on a separate computer and used by different people that supported uh, the accounts receivable. And as you realize that both programs need access uh, to information about customers, as well as the information about what sales took place, what was shipped to the customers, how much uh, uh, those shipments were, and uh, so and check what the customer was actually paying back and whether uh, the uh, cash collections from those customers uh, were sufficient to meet the obligations that those customers had. Uh, in the mid to late 1960s, without any exception, all such programs were completely separate and there was no integration between them and people knew that was a problem. So uh, that that's one of the reasons why uh, early database management systems appeared already in the mid to late 1960s uh, that were designed to solve this issue. So database management systems were designed to be the central repository of data, a single corporate repository that all the application programs will rely on and uh, would uh, actually therefore have access to exactly the same data and the database management system would become basically the integration point of the enterprise. Now, uh, because of the limitations of information technology at that time, as well as the early stage of development of software, those early database management systems uh, were very hardware oriented. Uh, so they were uh, designed to be very efficient because they had to use limiting processing power and relatively slow secondary storage devices uh, to meet the needs of corporate applications. So they had to be extremely efficient. Uh, and the price to pay was uh, the rigidity of those applications. So whatever you wanted to do with the data in the future had to be anticipated very early on at the stage when a database was created. Now, uh, such early database management systems became known as the so-called hierarchical database management systems. Uh, and the uh, best known example of hierarchical database management systems is the so-called IMS database, was, which was uh, developed by IBM. IBM uh, was uh, the biggest vendor of uh, business computers, the so-called IBM mainframes, particularly their systems 360 and subsequently system 370 and their descendants became the mainstay, mainstay of corporate computing. And uh, uh, IBM was also developing business applications for those computers. So it should come as no surprise that IBM was also the developer of uh, the most powerful hierarchical database of that time, IMS. It turned out to be incredibly successful and managed to remain, uh, I would say, probably the leading, uh, the dominating at times database management system in the market for probably around two decades, which is incredible longevity. By the way, there are versions of IMS which are still around even today. Uh, of course, uh, it has been rewritten multiple times and the current incarnations of internet IBM mainframes look nothing like those early uh, devices, but yeah, software has incredible longevity. Now, uh, those systems were utilized uh, in accounting applications as well, but they were very rigid. And therefore people were looking for, for alternatives, how to design more flexible uh, database management systems. So there were partial advances. There was a whole generation uh, of database management systems that provided much more flexibility than hierarchical systems. 
uh, but was relatively short-lived called uh, network databases. Uh, there was even a the whole organization called Cadacil. So that was one of the proposals that I studied when I was a graduate student. Uh, then uh, there was another approach, which interestingly enough also originated from IBM. Uh, in 1970, 1970, one of the computer science researchers working for IBM, actually a mathematician by training, whose name was Cod, C-O-D-D, uh, published a proposal how to create a very flexible uh, database management system uh, that would be almost completely divorced uh, from the details of the underlying hardware and would present just a logical interface that he thought would be universally understood and easy to use. Uh, so he proposed the model of what he called relational data banks and published it in the fall 1970 issue of the communications of the ACM, Association for Computing Machinery, which was one of the, still is one of the premier trade journals uh, in the field. Uh, now, as I said, Dr. Codd was a mathematician by training uh, and he was under this impression that there is nothing easier to understand or more basic than a set theoretic notation. So set theory was an agreed upon foundation of mathematics. So even uh, after the first introductory courses, even after high school, uh, people were expected to understand it. And he tried uh, actually to describe the model and how it can be operated on using set theoretic notation, you know, sets, intersections, subsets, supersets, uh, the tuples to represent uh, observations, uh, relationships between them. And he believed uh, that it was very easy for the end users to work with. Now, IBM, uh, understood that they needed to, to diversify uh, their offerings uh, in the database field. And even though uh, this proposal looked like a pipe dream in 1970, already in the early 1970s, IBM had a research projects going on devoted to the construction of working prototypes of this relational system. Uh, in the late 1970s, early 1980s, I personally got a chance to play with some versions which were at that time considered kind of production, not exactly, but definitely uh, beyond the stage of just research prototyping. And I can tell you that, so my latest memories probably date back to 81, 82. Uh, it was still basically a joke. So if you wanted to work with moderate sized data sets, say con consisting of several hundred observations, and you wanted to execute operations on them, you would start an operation and then you can go and have a cup of coffee uh, and wait until it finishes. So obviously it was not at the level that the uh, market required, but the progress was incredible. And already in the mid 1970s, uh, a lot of people realized that that was the future. And, uh, you know, IBM was a very rich company with several very powerful research centers, uh, huge research budgets. Uh, they could afford uh, these uh, research projects, even if they failed and produced nothing. But already at that time, startups started appearing that were devoted to the implementation of relational technology. So already in the mid 1970s, uh, the trajectory of information technology development clearly indicated that with very high likelihood, uh, relational systems were the future. So one of those startups became a company that most people 
know even today that this is still one of the largest uh, software companies in the world. It is called Oracle Systems. Uh, so already in the mid to late 1970s, they were working on the production versions of a relational database. And I can tell you that a decade later, uh, Oracle was a viable uh, relational database in the market. So, and uh, a decade later, it became the dominant database. So by the mid to late 1990s, uh, all the largest, well, not, I, no, I am exaggerating. May, most of the largest uh, database systems were running on Oracle. IBM was not idling, by the way. Uh, their research projects uh, also resulted after many iterations uh, in producing an extremely powerful uh, relational database that, that is called DB2 and has been, uh, so if you work, say, in the financial services industry, depending on where you are, you may be a bank or an insurance company or things uh, like that, there is a very good chance uh, that they will still have computers which are of the IBM mainframe type and they may be running DB2 because they have very, very large data sets to work with. So uh, this tells you that, uh, by the, and by the way, just to finish this uh, generic software and uh, hardware story, uh, relational databases are mainstay of our modern life and corporate computing. And with no exception, all modern accounting information systems run on top of relational databases. So those things that originated just slightly half a century earlier uh, in, in 1970. Now, uh, how do we make a transition to this topic? So as I said, Code believed uh, that uh, regular users would be very happy uh, to work with set theoretic notation and would be very comfortable uh, using relational systems. After all, it didn't require any programming. Uh, the systems uh, were designed using the so-called declarative tools. So if you read uh, the paper that was assigned for today, uh, that probably you caught somewhere closer to the end of the paper, this discussion about uh, the differences between declarative and procedural means that uh, so uh, uh, even though uh, commercial programming uh, was barely two decades old uh, by the 19 uh, by 1970 uh, it was clear that declarative means where you simply say what you want instead of describing a procedure how to do that should be easier for the end users but Easier is not the same as easy. And uh, therefore, already in the early 1970s, a lot of people realized that a higher level toolkit was needed uh, to develop uh, database systems. So a higher level of abstraction, a simpler way uh, to represent models of meaning, as we call them, semantic models, that would then be translated into what we call database schemas. And that original movement culminated in the mid 1970s, uh, 1976 to be precise, uh, in the publication of a book by Peter Chen, uh, who proposed the so-called entity relationship modeling tool. So try a way of representing uh, high level models that can be subsequently uh, implemented in database management systems, uh, but allow end users uh, to uh, represent what they were doing at this very high level of abstraction. So that was uh, the development in computers and information systems. Led with that led to the 19, late 1970s when Bill McCarthy started working on creating these abstract semantic models 
that uh, just so <laughs> it didn't happen by chance, but the end result of that was creating the models of modern uh, business information systems. Okay, so that was the development, as I said, in computers and information systems. There were some important developments in accounting. So you know that accounting as a discipline uh, is one of the oldest professions. So as the old joke goes, it may be the second oldest profession. Uh, it uh, counts close <coughs> to 5,000 years of age. Uh, modern accounting is that we associate with double entry bookkeeping is just slightly over 500 years old. Uh, but uh, a lot of conceptual development in accounting was happening uh, in the 1960s and 1970s. And among the notable things that contributed to what uh, Bill McCarthy was doing was uh, uh, the proposal by Sorter, uh, the most notable publication was in 1969 of the so-called event view of accounting, event-driven model of accounting, and the subsequent work, theoretical work by a very important theorist in accounting of U UG Jiri, uh, who in the mid-1970s also published several influential things. And, uh, and if you read carefully the paper by Bill McCarthy, you will see that he gives credit particularly, well, both to Sorter and to Ajiri uh, when he presents his resources, events, and agents model. So these theoretical developments emphasize the limitations of accounting as it was understood until then. Accounting for a very long time uh, had a very limited focus. Uh, and, and the focus was to present the results of business operations in monetary terms. And it, it shouldn't surprise anybody because, of course, this is the most uh, important aspect of what is going on. If a business is not making money, that business is not viable and it will disappear. It will go under, right? It is not a going concern as we say, uh, but at the same time, people were realizing that uh, uh, this view was quite limited and uh, very often would shortchange, uh, particularly those people who had to run the business in how they could run it better. So they needed more information and better information and the conventional accounting systems uh, we're not providing that. Now, uh, at the same time, uh, these systems were not sufficient for the, needs, for the needs of other stakeholders. It's not just the managers, but there are, uh, and not only people who work in the accounting departments, uh, but uh, a lot of different uh, users in the enterprise needed access to business relevant information. Uh, in some cases, that information would be provided by their custom-made systems, uh, but those systems were completely divorced uh, from the accounting systems and the traditional general ledger system would not be able to provide information that would be useful to them. Another problem was uh, the level of aggregation. You may not realize it, but even at the stage of journalizing transactions, so those of you who have taken introductory accounting should know what I'm talking about. But when you make what is considered uh, to be the very first accounting entry, so you analyze what happened, maybe you have some source business documents, and you create the very first accounting entry will be a journal entry of the transaction. Already at that stage, a lot of information is already lost and a lot of information is already pre-aggregated. So important details uh, may be omitted. So you may record, uh, for example, that your retail operation just sold a shirt for $30, but you may not indicate, uh, even if you say a man's shirt, so you may not indicate uh, that it was, I don't know, a pink shirt in the size extra large. Okay, and, uh, 
and actually the managers would have no clue that it is really the pink shirts in the size extra large which are selling particularly well uh, in this business. So you see, even that first journal entry may not omit so this important type of information uh, because there is this filtering which is focused on capturing financial results and this filtering would ignore uh, these details. Even if they did capture it, the structure of accounting artifacts, accounting books as we call them, journals and ledgers, uh, would not allow easy access to that information. So imagine that, okay, uh, in the description, in the sales journal, uh, you add to this transaction that actually that man's shirt was pink in extra large. Uh, but how can you find it? Uh, you cannot just uh, go page by page uh, even if it is in the electronic form, it would be very difficult for the technology of the time to search for that kind of information. So those accounting systems that existed were simply not designed to provide access to many important features and characteristics of business events that were happening in the enterprise. And as I already mentioned before, all these systems uh, were completely uh, separated. So they were standalone systems, would typically run on different computers, maybe even in different uh, data centers. Okay, so and there would be no connection between them. So almost basically no integration. So that was the problem. Okay, and that problem existed uh, all the way, I would say. So in one form or another, it would keep manifesting itself. Uh, for another several, two decades. And the only viable solutions that companies started deploying on a significant scale, I would say that they reached the market in that form only by the mid 1990s. So as far as we're concerned, uh, this the victory, the success story of what we are talking about here perhaps, is the story of the last quarter century, right? So it started happening in the second half of the 1990s. And this is, by the way, uh, when people started paying more attention to the theory that I am presenting you tonight, even though that the theory itself was developed fairly well in the late 70s, early 1980s. So you see, it takes time uh, for these things to catch up. And as I said, so this is the second paper and uh, uh, a really well-developed paper uh, that was published in 1982. And if the so-called uh, enterprise resource planning systems vendors uh, were aware of these developments, I believe that they could have avoided uh, many pitfalls in the way of their creation and deployment of enterprise management systems. But often people don't even realize what is already available. Okay, wait, wait a second, so, okay. Uh, so what, uh, uh, what, uh, what do we do here? So we, in this paper, we study an abstract model of, uh, of a business system. So this is this, we are uh, attempting to create the so-called data model, a semantic model of information which is of relevance uh, to the enterprise. Now, uh, you see here uh, certain steps that people usually go through uh, when they start developing models like that. So one is requirements analysis. Then we'll talk about the so-called view modeling and view integration. We will see that uh, we'll talk about local views, which actually people uh, in uh, different uh, uh, business silos, uh, business domains uh, see uh, and they need to operate and how all this integrates uh, into the so-called conceptual schema, which is the enterprise-wide model, the global model, which integrates all of that. And finally, something which 
uh, will be pretty much outside the scope uh, of this paper is the so-called internal schema, uh, which will be uh, specific uh, to the technology at hand. So uh, the theoretical development in this paper is technologically agnostic. Uh, it, uh, it doesn't really require, say, the usage of uh, a relational model or relational database management systems, even though uh, it fits those systems perfectly, uh, simply because uh, the development of this abstract model was inspired by the needs of those systems. But you can actually implement, create uh, internal schemas using different models. Uh, but this database schema and how it is defined and there are special technological uh, tools to define schemas. Uh, for example, there is a standard nowadays uh, called uh, structured query language uh, called SQL or SQL, uh, which is used to de define those schemas. Again, those are technological details that are left outside the scope of the paper. So this the paper is uh, written at a well, fairly high abstract level. Okay, uh, so we are gonna be uh, dealing. So the, uh, the easiest way uh, uh, to think about it is to keep in mind the relational model, the model of entities and their relationships. And that was the model that, as I said, was developed by Peter Chen to, uh, to simplify uh, the life of relational database users. Uh, so what is an entity? Well, pretty much anything of interest to the enterprise. Uh, it can be a person, an object, or an event happening, anything. Now, those entities uh, are often related to each other. So, uh, for example, there can be an entity of inventory and another entity of sale. And they will be related to each other because a sale is actually a sale of some inventory items, okay? Uh, there will be also, say, another entity called customers. And again, sales will be related to that entity as well uh, because uh, we're selling uh, our inventory to our customers, okay? So uh, relationships are very important. So the type of relationships I just described to you, the examples, I'm sorry, the examples of the relationships I just uh, given to you are the examples of the so-called associations. Uh, there are other kinds uh, of relationships, uh, for example, relationships of generalizations. And uh, these will be, uh, say, uh, common when you uh, talk about, uh, say, certain relationships within entities, like, say, you can have finished goods inventory, uh, and also you have uh, raw material inventory. So if you're talking about a manufacturing enterprise, then uh, usually they will have those different kinds of inventory, right? And the whole manufacturing process is nothing but a conversion of raw materials first into work in process and then into finished goods inventory, right? So the, but those types of inventory are related to this more general type called inventory, right? Both finished goods and raw material inventory are still inventory. So if you are talking about the entity of inventory, then it is a generalization of those special types of inventory that we call finished goods or raw material. And again, that's a different type of a relationship. Uh, any questions so far? By the way, uh, I'm moving pretty fast. I would prefer if you just don't hold your questions and start talking. Don't raise your hands. It would be difficult for me to see raised hands. Just unmute yourself and start talking whenever you want to ask a question. Don't worry about throwing me off, okay? I am not going to lose my train of thought. I'll stay with it, okay? So just make sure you ask questions, very important. Professor, I have, I, have, I have a question. Sure. 
so the the real we have like a relational uh you know database like called like a SQL, and like what's the relationship between the SQL and like developing like this like a semantic model so the tools that we are talking about are a higher level of abstraction okay so a sql is well by the way sql is also pronounced as sql right so that's the common way for those who who don't know this is the structured query language and uh, say uh, if we are talking about say creating a database then uh, uh, there is a part of sql that provides the tools of the so-called data definition language Okay, so the name uh, structured query language uh, is uh, misleading. Uh, it is somewhat of a misnomer because, it, again, I'm going a little bit off course, but uh, so let me clarify this. So um, uh, in database terminology, people distinguish between three different categories of languages. Data definition languages, data manipulation languages and data query languages. So DDL, uh, uh, DML and DQL. Uh, SQL is all of them. So the name seems to suggest that this is just a query language, but it's actually, it's a universal standard. Uh, and for example, as a part of the, the, and SQL has different statements. So as a part of a DDL, data definition language, there is a statement called create table. And uh, when you create a relational database, so in SQL, you will discuss, okay, I create table, uh, you will define uh, the primary key in the table, foreign key, so do all those are technical means of implementing a more abstract model. So what we work with here, is this higher level of abstraction, which most commonly will be implemented using SQL, but can be implemented using other technological tools. So did I answer your question or not? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Well, maybe not, but, but then ask a more specific question because maybe I didn't get what you wanted to ask. So uh, help me. Yeah, so, so the the author like like developed like this like a semantic model like after he's seeing the SQL database, right? No, SQL appeared later. If my oh. memory doesn't fail me, the first SQL standard, and by the way, there have been uh, a number of different SQL standards. It's an ANSI standard now, American National Standards Institute. Uh, I believe the first SQL standard is 1986. And the first paper and this whole thing actually started uh, in the mid 1970s, a decade earlier. So those technical tools uh, started becoming available a little bit later. So this uh, went in parallel, but the need for that was clear because uh, if you uh, say open a textbook in the theory of relational databases, and there have been a number of different textbooks, so I studied uh, one of them. Uh, you actually you would see algebraic notation. So you would see it, it looks like a text in abstract algebra. Uh, but that's not what actually regular users would be able to utilize. They needed uh, much easier to use tools. So say entity relationship diagrams uh, provided such a toolkit, you know, when entities are represented uh, by rectangles, uh, relationships are represented by diamonds, and you can add a list of attributes. It's very graphical and easy to relate to, okay? So it is not just abstract algebraic notation that gives you just abstract symbols for sets, their subsets, their intersections, and all that. So Cod, who was a trained mathematician, thought that it was easy. I can tell you that he was actually uh, mistaken, I would say, by several orders of magnitude. Because not only that was not easy, but then people realized that even these graphical tools that we discuss here, even SQL, is not easy either. 
even though it was proposed as the end user language. So structured query language is a declarative language. Uh, it is not a language where you would describe computational procedures. You only describe the results that you want. Uh, but even this language today is used either by professionals or by uh, highly trained application people. So even that. So that's the reality of working with computers. So uh, 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 only when we get to a stage when, say, artificial intelligence uh, tools for natural language processing uh, get to the stage where at the level of those tools, they will be able to resolve all the ambiguities and come up uh, with a reasonable formal interpretation of what those humans actually mean, maybe then we'll get those uh, interfaces to our systems that regular humans will be able to use. Well, until then, you, you're stuck dealing with this. But, but we are dealing with a much higher level of abstraction here. We are not dealing with SQL, not in this paper and not in this approach. Well, I mean, SQL will come next. So when you go to the physical level, when you create a physical model uh, of the database, then you will use SQL to define that model, but not at this stage. So other questions. Okay, uh, so let's take a look at a few examples. Uh, so as I mentioned already, entities are represented by rectangles. Uh, so you see, uh, several different entities here. And uh, more specifically, you see actually a generalization hierarchy. So at the very bottom of this hierarchy, you see entities of clerks, salespeople, and professionals, right? So all of them are actually different categories of employees working for a particular business entity. Uh, but they're not the only kinds of agents involved with that business entity. And what you see at the second level are categories of, uh, say, stockholders and categories of customers and vendors who are all actually, as you see here, subcategories of agents that would be related uh, to a particular uh, business entity, would have a relationship uh, with a particular business entity. So this is just a very simple example of a generalization hierarchy. Any questions here? No questions, but I just, uh, I wanted to say that I actually like the um, representations in this paper. It was surprisingly interesting to me. I mean, no offense, it's, it's just, I never expected to, to find something like that interesting, but I like the logic. I, I just, I like the connections. I like the diagrams. I think it just, it speaks to me um, in a way that is more understandable than just like looking at like paragraphs, just looking at the diagram and then the explanation and the logic behind it, I think just made sense. So I like that. Well, thank you. It's, good to know. it's actually, in my opinion, it's uh, it's a really a superbly written paper, particularly uh, if you just step back and realize that it was written 40 years ago. Uh, in most respects, uh, it remains incredibly modern. Uh, so if a paper like that would be written today, it would be very close to what was written then. I wouldn't say identical, but would be very, very close. It's actually, yeah, that's, uh, anyway. Uh, okay, so that was a statement of encouragement. So any questions? Okay, so that's another example of hierarchies where uh, you see uh, generalizations not only uh, along uh, this uh, axis of economic agents, but also along some other axis. So that's why you see it's like basically becomes almost like a three-dimensional thing. So one I already mentioned, which was uh, this generalization of different types of inventory, right? Finished goods, work in process, raw material. 
another one is uh, generalizations of different uh, types of transactions, like dividend distributions or equity investments, right? So those actually you'll see uh, later that uh, what these are, these are actually different uh, categories of entities. So we'll actually call them later uh, agents, events, uh, agents, resources, and events, or REA resource events and agents. But here they are ordered in this way. Uh, okay. So this is this, uh, uh, the diagram uh, that presents this big picture. Uh, that uh, I was talking about. So on the right-hand side, uh, you see the so-called local views. Those uh, external schemata uh, that uh, different users of information systems would need. Okay, so people uh, who work in materials management or inventory management uh, would uh, want to see something like what is presented uh, on the lower right. Uh, accountants uh, would want to see the general ledger, right, which is presented in the middle on the right. And to say uh, front-facing people, uh, salespeople uh, or accounts receivable people uh, would want representation similar to what you see at the top, right? Uh, but we don't want to create multiple different systems uh, we don't want it for a number of reasons. One of the big ones is that it would make integration a very difficult task. So we want a single integrated system and therefore it needs uh, a single conceptual schema, a single data model. And this is what you see uh, in the middle, uh, on the left, well, you can say on the left and the middle of this uh, graph. So this conceptual schema is something that unites all of this, but it can be uh, projected, if you wish, into those local views that can be exposed uh, to individual users in those specialized application areas, right? So, but the model that we are concerned with and the model that we want to develop is this conceptual schema where you see uh, by the way, what you see uh, shown here is an entity relationship diagram as proposed by Peter Chen. So you see rectangles with the names of the entities in them. Uh, you see diamonds representing uh, relationships between those entities. Uh, and uh, there, will, there will be additional pieces of information that we're not gonna be worrying about here, like the attributes, uh, and things like that. So you see that all uh, that, and again, this is an abstract data model, okay? A semantic model. Now, uh, to use it, you would actually need to map it to a specific database, right? So, and this is where that internal schema will come into place. And uh, nowadays, and already, I mean, for the last three or four decades, uh, the specific technology used there is relational databases. So uh, upper left corner represents that actual relational database uh, that will support uh, business application programs where the data will be residing. So this gives you the big picture of what is going on. Now, and the paper is actually focusing on proposing a specific way of creating a conceptual schema. So this is the main question that the paper answers. So Peter Chen proposed this generic tool, entity relationship modeling. And uh, it looked nice and easy enough until you actually started employing it. And then people would have a lot of questions. So what are exactly the entities? How can you decide uh, what should become an entity and what is just an attribute of an entity? What kind of relationships those entities are supposed to have? Now, as a general tool, entity relationship modeling is completely silent on that aspect because, and it cannot be 
any other way because uh, that tool is applicable uh, for designing database models of pretty much anything. But we are not concerned with designing a data model of anything. We are, we are concerned only uh, with designing a data model of a business enterprise. So therefore, we should be much more specific what this conceptual data model of a business enterprise is supposed to look like. Okay, and so, and this is the primary objective to create this very specific guidance, to create something that later will be called a pattern of, uh, of any such model. So in modern terminology, these resources, events, an agent's uh, modeling approach is basically what would be called today an REA pattern of business information systems. So their data models should fit this pattern and it is specific enough and uh, therefore is much easier to use than a very, very general approach. So uh, what is this REA model? As I said, so uh, resources, events, and A. So REA stands for resources, events, and agents. And uh, to understand why this pattern is the way it is, you have to go back to the basics. So the interesting thing about this pattern, again, using modern terminology, which which is not used in this original paper, but is already used in the second paper, which was published almost a quarter century later that I included. Uh, this paper with a doctoral student of Bill Guido Gertz. Uh, so uh, in that paper, they explicitly state that this RA model is a normative model. So where do we derive this normative aspect from? Well, uh, we derive it from the common property of every business entity. So a business, any business entity is a profit seeking entity. So how does any business entity create profit? This seems to be like a very basic question, right? And actually, there are a number of different ways, but the most basic way uh, was through an exchange. Uh, an exchange of what? An exchange of what we call economic resources. So therefore, the very first thing that you see on this slide is uh, a definition of an economic resource and by the way, this is exactly where, say, Bill McCarthy falls back on the work of UGI Giri. Uh, so uh, what is an economic resource? So what, uh, what is a resource? Well, resource, and you know, when I, uh, I, obviously I don't have time for this today, but uh, when I teach information systems and I can spend more time explaining these models, I usually try to tease it out of my students. And uh, when you ask people what, how do they understand what a resource is, then it is always the same thing. So people uh, always remember that resource is something which is useful for something, has utility, as we call it. So if something doesn't have a utility, it is not a resource, okay? And very often, not always, but very often, uh, people forget another very important property of a resource which is scarcity. Uh, it is not sufficient to have utility. Uh, something can be scarce. And the same thing uh, can be scarce in some circumstances and can be available in abundance in some other circumstances. Uh, so a good example that I usually give in this case is, let's say oxygen. So everybody knows that oxygen has utility, right? We need it to breathe. If there is no oxygen, we suffocate. So there is a, a 
obvious uh, fact there is a sense that oxygen has utility to us. Uh, but usually in most circumstances, uh, oxygen is not scarce. Uh, and uh, say when I'm in the classroom and I offer people to sell them some oxygen, usually I don't get any buyers. Uh, at the same time, if I ask uh, my students to imagine themselves on a spaceship and offer uh, to sell them some oxygen there, then everybody realizes, yes, uh, that's the situation where I would probably pay for it. So these are the two key features. Uh, so utility and scarcity. And also it has to belong to the enterprise. You see, this is this ownership aspect. So it has to belong to the enterprise and be under the control of the enterprise. So for something to be an economic resource, okay? As I said, uh, profit, uh, one of the primary means of creating profit is uh, by exchanging resources. And in the early days of our civilization, uh, we usually had what we call today barter, exchange of one resource for another resource. So uh, somebody is good at uh, making shovels and another person uh, is good at growing grains. So that's a classical example of a barter uh, when you exchange, uh, say, grains for shovels, right? Now, uh, again, uh, there is a question of why this would actually create any profit for anybody if you assume that the participants are self-interested parties. So everybody uh, pursues uh, his or her own interest. And uh, why would anybody be able uh, to generate any profit? And the answer lies in basic economics uh, that I assume all of you have studied. Uh, and it has to do with the differentiation of the so-called utility functions. So different humans have different utility functions. This, by the way, uh, what pretty much created our civilization, right? You remember that settling down, uh, specialization of labor, and when labor becomes specialized, so some people become very good at growing grains. So the utility of grains to them is low, uh, while some other people are very good at making shovels, but they don't know how to grow grains. So for them, the utility of grains is higher, but the utility of shovels is low and vice versa. So there can be uh, a mutually beneficial exchange of resources in this case. So every party uh, will benefit, right? So this is what will create profit. So this is the basic, okay? If we are dealing with uh, business enterprises, which are profit, uh, seeking entities, then uh, the essence of it will be uh, happenings that we call economic events that affect change the resources which are under the control of that particular enterprise. So a typical economic exchange would be, say, uh, an enterprise uh, would uh, give I don't know, certain number of shovels for a certain number of bushels of grain, okay? Uh, so that's uh, uh, what people usually understand as economic events. Now, uh, in accounting, this whole exchange often would be considered as a single transaction with different sides. Uh, when people are focused on creating information systems, uh, they realized early on that uh, the information that those systems need to capture should be as detailed as possible. So therefore, we should not really be bunching different things together. And the exchange that I just described to you 
in reality consists, it is not a single transaction, it consists of two separate events that happen. And one event is giving shovels to our business partner. And the other event is getting grains from that business partner. So uh, in this case, we as an enterprise have two different resources. One we can call shovels and the other one is called grains. Uh, and in the first event, we give some shovels that we have. So our store of shovels is decreased. The inventory of shovels is decreased. In the other event, we are actually getting some grains. So our store of grains, our inventory of grains is increased. So these are two separate events. And in REA, as an in information systems in general, they are treated as such. So they are two separate events. They are modeled separately. So there will be two different entities in this language that we are talking about uh, to represent them. And uh, we also need to capture the fact that these two uh, different economic events are related. Uh, so what makes them related? Economic exchange. So why do we give shovels? We give shovels because we are counting on getting grains in return. Okay. So therefore, clearly, uh, substantively, we understand that in a model of the system that we are creating, we need to capture this relationship, okay? So that the relationship of an economic exchange, and it plays a key role in the REA accounting model and has a special name. It is called the relationship of duality, okay? So the duality relationship is a relationship between two different economic events such that one event decreases a resource while the other event increases a resource, which is often, but not always, a different resource. So like in the example I just gave. So we decrease the inventory of shovels, but increase the inventory of grains. Okay, so those are two uh, different resources, but it is not always the case. There are some interesting examples where we actually have dual events that affect the same resource. But uh, I'm not sure I will have time to talk about it tonight. I have a question here about the, um, I, I, I see the two different resources being exchanged, but um, in, in, in relation to events, so th those are considered two separate events. I would think it's one event since the event is the exchange. So they're still considered two separate events. They're absolutely considered two separate events, even if they happen at the same time. So that's a very important thing. So it's easy to understand that there are two separate events uh, in the case we are separated in time. And there are often examples where such kind of events would be separated in time. Like you ship goods to your customer on account, and then a customer sometime later will send you some money in okay. payment for those goods. So there is no doubt that, the, that those two are two separate events. They happen at different times. But an important caveat here is even it, if, even if they happen simultaneously, they're different events. They are still different events because so they're when, different things. They affect different resources. Yeah. Yeah, the two resources, it's easy to see there's completely two different resources. But so I guess we don't call the event the exchange. We call the event increase of shovels, decrease of grains. So Correct. Two, those are the two events. Okay. Right. As, as, so that An we. Economic event okay. is any event that changes a resource. So just accounting, <laughs> speaking like in the same way. Uh, yeah. Well, yes, there are some subtle distinctions okay. because uh, 
I don't really want to jump ahead, but I want, but at the same time, I want to emphasize that this is not a mirror image of what you see in conventional accounting textbooks. And the best example I want to give here is uh, the difference between resources and assets as they're understood in accounting, okay? A resource is always an asset, but not every asset will be considered a resource in some very commonly used uh, conceptual models. And uh, as an example, I can tell you that uh, in most of the modern approaches, accounts receivable, which is clearly an asset, will not be considered a resource, okay? And uh, when you, uh, and it has to do, this is a modeling decision. And uh, the most common view uh, in REA today is, let's say that accounts receivable is a claim. It is a residual claim, okay, to something that the enterprise has. But it is not a resource per se. There may be modeling approaches where claims in some cases are treated as the so-called base objects, but usually they're not, okay? So we'll get a little bit later to this issue uh, and I will probably talk more, but here I want to emphasize this aspect. So this is not just, it is actually, there are some important differences, uh, conceptual differences between this and what you see in regular accounting. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay. So any questions about resources, economic events, duality? So my final remark about duality is that uh, this is one of the benefits of this REA pattern, already jumping a little bit ahead. What this discussion shows is that when you create this conceptual model of your business information system, and your model includes a certain economic event, no matter what that event is, you should always look for a dual one because you know that usually, you know, self-interested agents will not waste their resources. So if there is an event that changes a resource, there has to be a dual event that works in the opposite direction. Okay, so and this is very specific guidance that tells you something about the properties of your model that you're trying to create. Okay. Any questions about this? Hi, Professor. So when you say that accounts receivable is not typically resource, considered right. as resource, but what if you are mortgage it? like to the bank. It doesn't matter. Your it's resource. Not a resource. No. Well, you're saying with accounts receivable, you usually you, you just, uh, some people sell them, right? So you can sell them and you can obtain value for that residual claim, right? But it is not uh, considered to be a resource. There are other things, you know, it's not just, I can give you, uh, you know, accounts receivable is just the easiest example of something which is not a traditional resource, but you can sell. Uh, so these days, uh, a customer list is something that you can sell. You can monetize it. You know that 
a lot of businesses simply monetize information, right? Uh, now, in most traditional modeling that is used in REA, uh, that information would not be considered a resource. So it is possible to create a model where it is, as I said. So there is this very interesting discussion, uh, for example, as far as the as far as accounts receivable are concerned, uh, in this uh, closer to the end of this uh, paper that talks about the issue of treating claims as the so-called base objects. And then everything else would apply. So if you can do that, uh, but usually you don't. And usually you don't. So it, it is an example of what is definitely an asset in accounting, but in traditional REA approaches would not be considered a resource, but uh, a balance of trade. Other questions? Uh, I also have a question about exchange. Okay. Um, is based on your um, description, is exchange only with vendors? No. Well, uh, uh, the example that I gave you has nothing to do with vendors. It's with the customers, right? Oh, it's uh, right, right, right. It's just with customers. Well, but you mentioned yourself. There are, there are obviously exchanges with vendors as well, right? Then, then is consumption um, included in this exchange concept? Uh, what do you mean by consumption? So you're talking about individual humans. So because usually, this, usually yeah. we don't create these models for individual human beings. Uh, I'm not sure what you would call consumption. consumption uh in the uh case of a regular business entity so there are certain things you know that we call overhead right so you need to pay for office space uh for electric utilities uh things like that they all can be modeled as economic exchanges we don't always do that uh, but conceptually it can be done that's another issue the issue, uh, again, so closer to the end of this article, they talk about certain limitations of the model where we don't want uh, to push it to the extreme, the application of this model. But conceptually, you can. So what do you mean by consumption in this case? Because we're dealing with business entities. What oh, would I, I just see in the second bullet point that... The breaking up. And concept. Consumption are. Uh, you, could you please repeat? You were breaking up, so it's probably the internet connection. Oh, um, okay. I mean that I just saw in the second bullet point that um, you listed exchange and consumption as kind of parallel. Um, well, I mean, can you hear me now? Yes, I do. Yes. Uh, and in that case, yeah, it's still an economic event, right? So uh, the most typical consumption, I don't know, I buy food, right? Uh, so my uh, inventory of food goes up, right? So I gave some money for it. But uh, what happens then? Well, I eat it uh, in exchange for what? Uh, well, in exchange for not being hungry, and being able to function another day. Would I want to model uh, this uh, exchange explicitly? Uh, probably not. So uh, there are some limits here, uh, but uh, you know, the term consumption as used here uh, would be, uh, you know, again, I, I gave you a very simple example uh of a uh, duality which had to do uh what we call a merchandising business basically an exchange of one good for another good so a more typical example uh, of consumption say in the case of an rea would be the case of a manufacturing enterprise uh, and in manufacturing enterprise 
uh, what happens uh, there, the economic events are of a different nature. So we have to use a terminology which people started using a little bit later on. So the economic events uh, that I gave as examples here are known as the so-called transfers. Okay, so when you take a good and move it from one agent to another agent. Okay, so, and this is what typically happens when we describe exchanges, right? So the economic events themselves are the so-called transfers. So there is a different type of an economic event, which is called transformation. Not transfer, but transformation. And this is what happens during a production run. Uh, so if you are a manufacturing enterprise, then you will have an economic event where you consume uh, a certain amount of uh, raw materials uh, in exchange for uh, producing a certain amount of finished goods. Okay? So uh, in this context, probably it's better to think about consumption in these terms, right? So, but the economic event itself would be called a transformation here, a transformation of raw material into finished good in the production process. I don't know if it clarified anything, but uh, so that's the meaning of the consumption term here. Professor, uh, I was thinking, um, thank you for referring to the manufacturing entity. And uh, I was in thinking about the consumption. I had in mind uh, such things as electricity, for example, uh, which, um, which has to be uh, present in order to run a production uh, facility. Correct. So, or a gas or if depending on the type of... Uh, or no, I, under, I understand, I understand your point, yes. yes. Okay. So and th those are the... And if we ask, for example, anyone from the manufact manufacturing field, for them consumption is uh, are those things. And as you correctly stated, raw materials as well, in order to run, in order to generate a final product. Right. So, so it's the, pretty much everything that, else. So, uh, Alexander, in the example that you gave, uh, electricity is just another resource. Okay, in the same way as, uh, so our conversion process, you know, that we use to convert raw materials into finished goods, it consumes not only raw materials, but some other resources, in particular electricity. Okay, in the case of electricity, in many cases, it makes even sense to measure it. Not always. So if you are, I don't know, if you are making aluminum, it is a must uh, to measure the consumption of electricity because production of aluminum requires a lot of electricity. Okay. Uh, if you are running uh, a retail store, uh, you probably will not measure separately uh, the consumption of the electricity uh, in your showroom as opposed to your warehouse. Even though that conceptually you could, and that would take us into the area, the question is why? And uh, these days, uh, there may be a good answer to that question. Again, if you go back into a different accounting discipline, right? So if you start drawing parallels with management accounting, uh, you remember that uh, in management accounting, there are a number of different approaches to costing. And a very common approach is uh, ABC, activity-based costing, okay? Uh, so if you are, uh, if you become really obsessed with implementing ABC at a very high level of detail, then maybe you will want to put a separate electric meter on your showroom and another electric meter on your warehouse, right? Because that would allow you to allocate 
uh, the cost of electricity to those different business processes. Okay, but in most cases, pre people probably would not do that. But if they are making aluminum, they will absolutely measure uh, the consumption of electricity. They will have certain standards. They will make sure that their production process is well controlled so that they don't waste uh, important resources, say aluminum ore or electricity or whatever else goes into that conversion process. Okay, I don't know, does it make sense? Yes, yes it does, thank you, I appreciate that. My pleasure. So other questions, please. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so what, the, what happens here? So when we talked about these uh, economic events and we talked about their relationships to the resources, uh, I, uh, I mentioned only that the relationship between different sides of exchange are special in REA and I gave them a name. I called them duality. But the relationships between events and resources are special as well, by definition, right? So we define an economic event as an event that affects a resource, right? So in REA uh, terminology, these relationships between economic events and the resources they affect are known as stock flow relationships stock flow relationships and uh, and this is what you see here so why do we uh, call them stock flow relationships because resources can be viewed as so-called stocks and their amounts are measured at a point in time okay so this is how stocks are measured. They are measured at a point in time. While uh, economic events result in changes in those stocks. So those changes can be either outflows or inflows, okay? And if we want to measure the aggregate impact of such economic events, then we measure it over a period of time. So it will not be a point in time measure because a point in time measure at the best will give us a single economic event. But if we want to measure an aggregate impact of an economic event, it will be over a period of time. Now, if you draw an analogy with conventional accounting constructs, then uh, the best analogy in this case is between balance sheet and income statement accounts. So as all of you, I assume, remember, so balance sheet accounts have balances as of a point in time, right? So when a company files their uh, financial statements, you often see that this is the balance sheet as of December 31st, 2020, okay? So balances uh, in the balance sheet accounts refer to a point in time, while balances uh, of the income statement accounts are aggregations of flows. And therefore they refer to the whole accounting period, right? So this is our total revenue for the 2020 fiscal year. Okay, so that starts, let's say in this case, January 1st and ends December 31st. So this is a valid analogy in this case, right? 
So what you see uh, in this example, so you see uh, two different things which are put together. You see the relationships between resources and events, and those are stock flow relationships. And also you see the relationships of duality, which are relationships uh, between different economic events, okay? So for example, uh, a sale of finished goods results in the outflow of finished goods. But when we collect cash on that sale, so that cash will pay for it. Okay, so that payment for it uh, is the duality, right? So cash receipt is a dual event to sale. By the way, what this diagram emits in this case is the other stock flow relationship because that cash receipt is the inflow into a different economic resource, which is called cash on hand, okay, which is not shown here. So this is an incomplete model, right? So we don't show everything. But this was just to emphasize that you have these two parts. So you have an economic event. On the one hand, it will have a stock flow relationship with the resource. And on the other hand, it will have a duality relationship with a different economic event. If uh, I were to take it a little bit further, so there is another consideration which is mentioned in this paper and mentioned in the subsequent paper and may not be spelled out as explicitly as what I just said. But here, when I was talking, uh, uh, about uh, duality and inflow outflow, I started with a single economic event, like sale. I'm looking at sale and I say, on the one hand, you have this uh, stock flow relationship with the resource. On the other hand, uh, you have a duality uh, relationship with another economic event. If I were to start with a resource, instead of starting with an economic event, I would have a somewhat different observation. If I start with a resource, I know that uh, if that, uh, that is a resource of the enterprise, right? It is used for something. So since we model it, it means that it is important to the enterprise. So for any resource, I should have economic events related to it. So, but here I would say again, uh, so there will, there has to be both an increment and a decrement, but of this very same resource. So there has to be an economic event that results in the inflow of this resource. And there has to be an economic event that results in an outflow of this resource. Now, this is different from duality. So it may sound very similar to what I was saying about duality, while in fact, it's a different aspect. It's a different thing. It's not the same. So where is the difference? Uh, in the case of duality, I start with the event. And they say for an economic event, there has to be a dual one. And as a side remark, I mentioned that actually these two dual events will often affect different resources. While in this latter example, I start with a resource and I say that there has to be two economic events, one incrementing and the other one decrementing this very same resource. Why is it the case? If you have a change in one direction only, if let's say it's a decrement, that resource sooner or later will be completely depleted 
and the company will not have it anymore. So any going concern will need to still use this resource for something. Otherwise we would not have it in a model. So we cannot deplete it completely without replenishing uh, the amount of this resource. Okay, so, uh, yeah, and it cannot be only increased because if we keep only increasing it, even if it is just money, sooner or later the quantity becomes astronomical and uh, it cannot happen either, right? So that's a different aspect. Now, uh, these two observations will allow the users to identify holes, gaps uh, in their conceptual models, in their conceptual schemas. They will discover that certain entities, more specific, uh, in some cases events, in some cases resources are missing and they have to model them to complete their, the, their diagram, their model. So these are very important observations and we derived them pretty much from the first principles. Any questions? Guys, I realize it is 7.35 and I know I have to give you a break. How about a five minute break? And then we'll continue with the next slide. Is it okay? Okay, so you can step away, do whatever you need to do. We'll resume in five minutes at 7.40 Eastern time. Uh, professor, I have a question on the side. Sure. Have you had to, did you have to learn a whole? A whole she said voice him? Say it again? A whole, did you, did you have to learn a whole as the programming uh -oh. language? Algol, okay. Algol was uh, the first programming language I learned, but not Algol 68, it was Algol 60, 60. Oh, oh that's classic. Yes, Algol 68 was a monstrosity. And I took a seminar in Algol 68 uh, in my, at the end of my second year in college. By then I have already taken Algol 60, Fortran 4, uh, assembly, uh, IBM 360, uh, something else. Uh, but I can tell you uh, that Algol 68, in my opinion, uh, was dead on arrival. It was such a complicated language that the compilers were incredibly heavy. Uh, why the, by the way, I'm curious, very few people know about Algol 68. You are showing your age, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> By the I, way, I, I did PL one in my in my master's thesis. Well, Miklas, what really shows my age? I can tell you uh, that uh, I started with Fortran four, even though Fortran seventy seven was already defined. So we switched to Fortran seventy seven, but uh, later, much later. I have no idea. I use Fortran a lot. I don't know if it was Fortran 1 or 77. I had no idea what it was. I am. I would bet my life that you used Fortran 4. I don't know. I, I know that uh, I want to see my age. I, when I would put together this first computer with Pookie, the only way to enter data with it wasn't even uh, cards, was paper tape. I know. Well, I saw it, never used it. So, you know, this is an example that I give my students. And I say that there was a time when cut and paste was not a metaphor. <laughs> well, you know, to, to change a code, you would put scotch tape on the paper tape and there was little metal with holes and you would make holes with your with a needle. No, I yeah, make, you would I, also I, get I, like a I metal. have seen people using scissors to literally cut a part of the paper tape. Yeah, yeah, that's what we did. That's what we did. And uh, the other thing that was pretty cool was the happiest day of my life was when we got Fortran to use. I was, we were doing all in machine language and then in assembler and Fortran was so easy to use. 
well, Fortran was a great language, uh, except for one problem that for a long time, well, you know, uh, I, I did gain access to a terminal in the second year in college, but, uh, but it was still mostly punch cards. And uh, with punch cards, do you, do you remember Epsidic? You work with uh, with I IBM. I remember Epsidic. How could I forget Epsidic? Yeah, and uh, and job control language. You remember JCL? JCL. But you know, my even my continuous audit project used the JCL at Bell Labs in the eighties because uh, the way we collected data, we extracted reports and data from the reports, and we had to do JCL to route the reports uh, in addition to where they are going to the Bell Lab station. Of course. Well, I mean, uh, listen, uh, for my PhD dissertation, uh, I actually as an illustration, I needed to solve a fairly large integer programming problem. And the best option at that time was still an IBM mainframe. It was a system 370 with virtual memory. Uh, I don't remember if you remember, uh, if uh, at that time, IBM was producing something called uh, o OSL, Optimization Subroutine Library where mm. they had an integer program solver. The batch of punch cards that I carried had uh, almost 800 cards in them. Can you imagine I, I carried it in my uh, suitcase? And if you dropped it, you are doomed because you have to go one by one, enjoy it. I actually, I ran the computer center at Tuki. And we had the 370, 165. It was pretty nice, actually. Well, oh, of course, particularly uh, after you get it after 360. So my first computer was a 360 thing, which had 128 kilobytes of RAM. And when the first 370 arrived with 256, and the big deal was virtual memory. Do you remember when IBM enabled virtual memory? in those 370 enabled virtual memory. There was no virtual memory. I, I remember VS2. Oh, that's, yeah. That too. But also, uh, you know, uh, then later on, my ex, uh, I switched to PDP-11. If you, you remember mini computers? That became... Yeah, of course I remember PDP-3. And when I was at Sloan School, we were using a PDP. Well, it was much cheaper. Yeah. And, uh, that was my first exposure to Unix, by the way. On a PDP-11, anyway. I actually only use Unix when I got to Bell Labs. Well, for a long time, you know, when I came here, the primary computer for me was the Sun Spark Station. So it was all Unix and X Windows. Yeah, that's what I had at Bell Labs, the Sun. Yeah. Okay. Uh, listen, I think we're back in business, right? So we had this chat reminisce yeah old guys like to reminisce okay so uh yeah let's let's move on so we talked about certain aspects of the rea pattern so uh let's move on now uh what else is important to model so i talked uh about resources and events so far uh, but uh, events don't run themselves. Uh, so somebody has to make it happen. And those entities uh, that make them happen or just take part in them are called agents. And uh, this is the last important type of entities that has to participate uh, in the REA pattern. So uh, events are either controlled by agents or agents participate in those events. So there will be, you'll see that there will be this relationship um, uh, between uh, events and agents, okay? Now, uh, it is also customary uh, to distinguish 
between the so-called internal and external agents. So in REA, when we talk about agents, uh, internal agents are typically employees and managers in the enterprise, while external agents can be customers, vendors, different business partners, uh, shippers. There may be different categories, different types of uh, external agents. So as far as internal agents are concerned, uh, there may be a certain relationship inside of them. So, for example, uh, enterprises typically have different departments or units, which are uh, subsets of agents. And uh, units usually uh, have a responsibility relationship with agents or subunits or agents, right? So this is uh, the hierarchy in the enterprise. So basically what it says that you can incorporate the organizational chart uh, of your enterprise uh, into this REA diagram. Uh, questions? Uh, <clears throat> so this is uh, the classical uh, REA pattern or REA accounting model as it was called uh, at that time. So you see uh, the entities of uh, resources, events, and agents and their units. Now, I'd like to draw your attention to the layout of this diagram. And this layout is not coincidental. It is intentional. Uh, and the acronym is indicative of this layout, the fact that we actually use uh, the sequencing, as you see in this acronym, REA, should remind you that uh, it is a good idea to show resource entities on the left, event entities in the middle, and agent entities on the right. So why is it a good idea to use this layout in the REA pattern diagram. Now, this is a good idea because uh, typically the way we model it, you would not see a direct relationship uh, between an agent and a resource. Uh, of course, uh, agents are related to resources. Now, for example, uh, Warehouse clerks ship goods from their inventory, right? Or uh, accounts receivable clerks uh, collect cash from the customers. So it does sound like there are relationships uh, between resources and agents. Uh, and that's correct. That's the economic reality of it. But if you uh, zoom in and look closer at those situations, you will realize that in all these cases, the relationships between agents and resources are mediated by events. So when you create an typical REA diagram, it will have relationships between events and resources on one hand and events and agents on the other hand. And you will not create uh, direct relationships between agents and resources that would cut across this diagram simply because they're always mediated by events. Events represent the essence of those relationships. Okay, so uh, you see different roles and different entities uh, that participate in these REA relationships. So this is a pretty exhaustive enumeration. So you see uh, uh, the stock flow relationships, as I said, so this is between events and resources, right? So an economic event is obviously a stock. Uh, I'm sorry, an economic resource is obviously a stock. An economic event is obviously a flow. 
uh, you see a duality. This is a relationship between two economic events and in which one uh, plays the role of the increment, the other one plays the role of a decrement. Uh, you see the relationships of control or participation. Uh, in this case, uh, so an economic event is a part of an exchange transaction, while there are economic agents which are outside or economic units, responsible parties inside, and there is this responsibility or superior subordinate relationship uh, between economic units. So again, this is just this comprehensive summary of what we identified so far in this REA pattern. So you should be finding uh, things like that. Guys, make sure you turn on uh, your webcams. Okay, so I'm trying to look, you know, I arranged my screen uh, so that I can see your webcams. So when I see that it's switched off, it throws me off. Any questions? Because we don't want anyone napping through class, correct? That's and correct. Be like, oh. yes. <laughs> so and I, I, do, do, and I do realize uh, that this material uh, can have an important side effect of a sleep aid, but uh, nonetheless, you have to fight it. Okay? <laughs> So it will be also helpful to look at the model and at the previous slide that uh, so when we saw the flow and we talked about the mediating um, effect of economic event. So it's a middle between the both sides. So and when we move to the other slide, um, can we add, uh, are those this? So when you, for example, look at control, are these considered dimensions? For, for that specific variable? No, it's uh, it's the type it's of a relationship in this case. Oh, okay, so these are different types. This is the, this is the type of the relationship. Now, please okay, don't it, confuse okay. it with okay. a concept of, uh, there is a concept, it is a related concept, but it is not the same. The concept of a process control. Now, process controls are defined in the next paper. Actually, they happen to be outside the scope of this initial attempt of creating a conceptual model because process controls are usually uh, expressed in the form of constraints on what can happen in a business process. Right, and these are the... Got it. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, sorry for I, hopefully, I will get to it tonight. If not, that next week. And this will be a part of a superstructure that we call the policy infrastructure, as opposed to be as opposed to what we are considering today, which is the foundation. This is the accountability infrastructure. We are so in this case, so agents are simply running events. So we say that agents control internal agents are running events, okay? So in that sense, they control, we say that they control events. So I understand that there is, there may be a possible confusion in the meaning of the word control. So this simply says that certain uh, active parties make events happen, okay? This is not about defining uh, constraints of what can and cannot happen. This is just the expression of fact that they make it happen and nothing else. Okay, yeah. thank you. I appreciate it. That's, uh, yeah, that was uh, a bit confusing and especially, okay, good. Thank you. Any other questions? So what is this guidance which is provided uh, by the resources, events and agents uh, model? Uh, so, and you see the steps uh, which are represented here. And then they uh, actually, later on, they become a part of a very formalized uh, system development process. Uh, there is even a discipline called system development life cycle, all right? And we used to have a course for our MBA students, which was called design and development of information systems, used to have number 604. And there we would just develop a good number of, devote a good number of lectures to SDLC. 
so you start by identifying the data requirements uh, to run things and make certain decisions. Okay, and then you have to represent them in this abstract form. Basically, create uh, this uh, REA model and form a, com a restructured complete uh, structural model out of it. Okay, so this is this approach that people usually follow. So this is an example where they say, well, uh, uh, let us start uh, with a couple of business processes. Okay, so one process, uh, uh, well, uh, in a way you'll see that they're both parts of what we call today procurement or purchase to pay, but in the old days, you would have a separate process called purchasing. Uh, corporate purchasing. And this is what you see at the top of your slide, right? So, and what happens in this process, uh, you see some people inside your enterprise, we call them buyers, right? They work with uh, entities outside your enterprise, we call them vendors. So here you see that we have these internal and external agents. And uh, the main event in this process is called purchasing that results in the increase of your inventory, okay? Whatever that inventory happens to be, right? Uh, it can be the inventory of uh, goods for sale, right? If you are in merchandising business, uh, it can be an inventory of raw material or say spare parts, if you are uh, uh, a manufacturing business, whatever it is, but basically, this abstract representation of corporate purchasing is given by the upper half of this slide, right? Now, there is a related process, which again, used to be basically separate uh, in every uh, large enterprise. It would be called accounts payable, okay? Accounts payable would be uh, driven mostly by the accounting people not by the corporate purchasing people who work with vendors, agree on prices, negotiate discounts. Now here, the only thing that happens, I mean, you have some bills which come due and uh, you have to pay them. Hopefully uh, trying to get as much benefit as possible because there can be different payment terms. Accountants are well known for uh, trying to get the float, right? So if you you keep the money in your account as long as you can so that you still don't use early payment discounts and then you pay, right? So uh, the main event here is cash disbursement. You have the same external agent called vendor, but you have a the different uh, internal agent, which is an accounting party here called cashier, and they work for the corporate treasurer, right? Uh, you also see a different resource. In this case, it's cash on hand, which is decreased, right? Now, uh, in the old days, you would have just these two separate models, even if you didn't use this terminology. Uh, when you do REA, it forces you to recognize duality. So you see, uh, duality is that relationship that connects the top with the bottom. So this is that economic exchange which is beneficial for both sides, right? And it forces the integration of these two models. So in the old days, these two would be even, even in accounting information system textbooks, uh, these two would be considered as two different business cycles. Okay, so there is a term that we still use, business cycle. So there was a one cycle called purchasing, there was another cycle called account payable, accounts payable. Now, uh, the, these days, you know, the integration of uh, enterprises achieved such a level that nobody talks about two, the, two, these two business processes separately, okay? So people don't call it that way anymore. They would call it either uh, procurement, or they will call it purchase to pay or procure to pay, P2P, okay? Like uh, 
there is a, a mirror image of this, which in the old days was a separate process called sales. And there was a separate call process called accounts receivable, right? A very similar thing. Now there is a duality relationship connecting them. And these days we would call it either the revenue process, those two things together, or we call it order to cash, O2C. So again, P2P or O2C. Yeah, yeah, you know, if you live long enough uh, in this field, you will see that people love inventing acronyms. So, and often, you know, uh, your challenge is to figure out what is truly new and what is just hype and a collection of new acronyms. Any questions here? Okay, so this is just uh, an elaboration on the comment uh, that I just made. So first we see this duality relationship, it forces integration, right? So what happens, uh, so an, uh, an interesting thing that happens in the integration. So uh, in the old COBOL driven systems, these uh, information would be kept in files, not in a database. So there would be a separate vendor file in the purchasing system. And there would be a separate vendor file in the accounts payable system. Okay. Now, obviously, those two separate things should be all in the same, right? You should have exactly the same information in both vendor files. Substantively, that's the case, right? There is no doubt about it. Now, uh, the challenge always was to keep them in sync. Information is not static. It keeps changing. So you have to have a reliable process in the enterprise that maintains those multiple sources of truth in sync, and it's difficult. So that was one of the many drivers of replacing uh, file-based systems with database management systems. Not only uh, you actually merge those things conceptually and your conceptual schema will have a single entity called vendor, but in a database, there will be a single data set that use vendor data set that will be used by all business applications that need access to vendor information. Uh, computer scientists call such an arrangement a single source of truth. Uh, it doesn't guarantee that your information will be always correct. Your vendor may move and will not inform you about that. So you may have obsolete contact information in your information systems and system. But what this arrangement guarantees is that you will never have a situation where your information uh, is out of, uh, it contradicts each other, that you have different data sets that are out of sync, that have to be synchronized, but a process fails and they get out of sync. If you have a single source of truth, there is nothing that can get out of sync, right? Because you try to store every piece of information only once. Actually, uh, there are some challenges that have to be overcome. So again, it's way beyond if you have courses in information systems, I assume you have learned about normalization of relational databases, how to bring uh, them in compliance. If it is a transactional database, at the very least, you would want to have basically compliance with the so-called third normal form. Uh, most likely not 100%, there are some elements of denormalization even in transactional databases, but mostly, right? So again, so there is some additional work involved, 
but I am trying to stay above those technological details. So I'm, and I'm trying to say that at the conceptual level, so we're integrating these local views into a global conceptual schema where we will have a single entity of vendors and it allows all these side benefits like say an eliminating inconsistencies right as well as many other things uh questions now uh when we uh create such a conceptual model uh there are a number of decisions uh that have to be made so for example there are this this uh combination decomposition decisions that we often have to make with entities. So for example, we have to make it uh, with resource and agent entities, right? So you see uh, uh, a couple of uh, examples here, right? Uh, now, uh, for example, as far as the inventory is concerned, right? So we already discussed that depending on the kind of your enterprise, that inventory may have to be decomposed into different subcategories, right? Uh, like raw materials, work in process, finished goods, or maybe something else. So that's one of the modeling decisions. And you make it at this stage when you do this integration of the local views and come up with, the, uh, with this uh, global uh, conceptual schema. In some cases, uh, you may do the opposite. So it's very interesting. Uh, uh, for example, you look at the specific types of internal agents uh, that participate in uh, different local views and different cycle models. So for example, in purchasing, you had buyers. In accounts payable, you had cashiers. Uh, do we need separate entities for them? Or should they be combined into a single entity called employees? In the example that you see here, the answer usually is yes, combine them. Why? Because there are no special data needs to keep them separate. Or there may be, it depends. So it depends on how we run an enterprise. So uh, if there are special data needs, we may have to keep it separate. Where would be a separate data need here? Uh, for example, if your enterprise, and again, we are getting into the area that starts overlapping uh, with actually control infrastructure, but if your enterprise, uh, for example, tries to limit what your buyers can do so that they cannot inflict uh, a lot of damage if they turn rogue, then you may have, uh, say, a special attribute for buyers, which you would call purchase limit. Let's say that certain buyers have a purchase limit of, say, $10,000, and they will not be authorized uh, to negotiate purchases above that. Okay, so obviously this is an example of a business process control and that would require a separate data attribute describing buyers. Then you would have to keep them as a separate entity and not put them together into a single entity of employees because they have that separate data need. Another example would be... Uh, say salespersons, uh, they may also need uh, a separate attribute to describe them uh, called uh, commission percentage. You know that salespeople often uh, have a significant chunk of their earnings due to commissions. You know, enterprises put in place different incentive schemes and having salespeople work on commission is very common. So in that case, you would also keep a separate entity called salespeople. But would it make sense to keep separately the entity of cashiers 
and the entity of warehouse clerks? And the answer is usually no, because you, there is nothing special to describe them. They all will be described as generic employees in exactly the same way. Again, these are examples of these combination decomposition decisions. They are modeling decisions that you have to make at the stage of creating this uh, global conceptual uh, schema, okay? When you do this, you may uh, identify some gaps. You remember I told you about the second requirement that for every resource, uh, you should have not only uh, events changing it in one direction, but also events changing it in the other direction. So if you go to the previous slide, you see that if you look at the resource of inventory, you see here only a relationship of inflow with the event of purchasing. So that principle tells you that in the global schema, there has to be another economic event related to inventory uh, that has the relationship of outflows, okay? You don't see it here, but you know that it should be present. And uh, of course, when you start modeling sales and uh, order fulfillment process, you'll realize that indeed there is an event called shipment when you ship goods to the customers that results in outflows from your inventory, right? And there will be that event in the global conceptual schema. But you don't see it here, but you know that it is missing because of that principle, okay? Uh, similarly, when you look at the economic resource called cash, you see only here, here you only see a relationship with cash, cash disbursements, uh, which uh, is outflow. So you know that there has to be other economic events that will have a relationship of inflows with cash, right? And of course, as we just discussed, obviously in this global uh, conceptual schema, there will be actually models uh, of events involved in your accounts receivable cycle, right? So there will be an event of a cash receipt when you collect it's a collection, right? So you collect cash on your sale and it will result in the inflow into cash. So those are additional considerations where, uh, that you have to check when you do this view integration. Guys, am I losing you? Okay. No, we're good. <laughs> okay. Excellent, because now we arrive at a very important concept in this uh, REA modeling approach, the concept of conclusion materialization. So what is a uh, conclusion materialization? This is actually a production of a snapshot. You have ongoing records of continuous activities. But from time to time, you want to aggregate that information to provide this overall view of what has been happening. And this information snapshot is called conclusion materialization. So what are we going to materialize conclusions about? So basically two important things, resources and claims, okay? Uh, resources and claims. So uh, what would that be? Is this like a balance sheet then? Sort of like resources and claims, like a balance of the assets and other, I mean. You can draw analogy to that. So yeah. when you try to, yes, when you, uh, you can view uh, the creation of financial statements as an example of conclusion materialization. 
So there are actually essential elements. Well, it's not only conclusion materialization because there are other things that you have to do, right? But a very essential part, so a big part of what you do uh, when you uh, create financial statements, uh, you materialize conclusions about what has, what has been happening. Okay, yes, yeah, so that's a very good analogy. You do other things. For example, uh, you will have to make certain estimates, uh, which is uh, related, but not exactly the same thing. Okay. So uh, what, uh, what are the examples? So the easy, we discussed some of them already. So when we materialize conclusions uh, about claims, uh, they will derive from the imbalances in the duality relationships. So what would be a specific example? Well, uh, what are the accounts receivable uh, from a particular customer? How can you know? Well, you'll say, well, don't we keep track of it? We have an account balance. Well, uh, that's a good question whether you should be maintaining that balance. And that's a very important uh, modeling consideration. But generally speaking, at the conceptual level, the answer is no, you don't need it. Why? Because you can calculate it. Now, uh, the general principle of information systems is to avoid duplicating information because it creates a possibility for inconsistency. So you want to avoid inconsistent states uh, in your information systems. Uh, do you need to maintain a balance on your customer's account? Theoretically speaking, the answer is no, because you can calculate it. You have a record of all shipments of goods to the customer. You have a record of all the collections of cash from the customer. You have a record of all the customer's returns, as well as a record of all the allowances that you may have extended to those customers, okay? So if you add up the value of all the shipments, subtract the amount collected, as well as the value of all the returns and allowances, the end result will be the current customer's balance. So this is a residual claim that you have against that customer. So when you do this, calculation, you actually materialize conclusion. This is what materializing conclusion means in this example. Should I repeat? So when we materialize conclusions about claims, so what we do in this particular case, in this example, we calculate the balance of trade. And we can do it because uh, we have a complete record of all events that affect this balance of trade. And when we do this aggregation and do the arithmetic, we actually calculate what it is. And do we need to calculate all of the components? Or for example, if one piece is missing, we still automatically can find like the plug-in thing. We can, what do you uh, mean by that? We, we are not supposed um, to have anything missing. Now, keep in mind that the premise of this system is that it maintains a complete record of all relevant activities that have happened. Oh, okay, okay. So it, it, doesn't, it does not um, assume that uh, you can arrive, let's say for the ending balance, if in, in, for example. So if so one- So we need a complete record of all the activities because yeah, okay. this is this is what we have to have. This is what an information system is designed for. So it is designed to capture all information about relevant happenings in this business. Okay. 
And then, uh, yes, our calculation will generate exactly the value that we are looking for. In this case, it will generate accounts receivable. If we add them up uh, for all the customers, that will be the value of the accounts receivable controlling account in the general ledger. Should we directly model claims as base objects? Okay. So in this case, so you see these uh, kind of entities that uh, just uh, shown in these uh, wiggly uh, rectangles. Well, if we did, if that were the modeling decision, then we would have to also create the flows, the models of inflows and outflows. So basically, when we ship the goods, we have an inflow into what we now call a resource called accounts receivable. Uh, when we uh, collect cash, we have an outflow from this resource called accounts receivable. Or similarly, you know, we can have uh, this uh, contra asset account called prepaid revenue, the same thing, right? Just in the in reverse, I mean, mirror image with the opposite signs. Uh, now, usually uh, it is not recommended to do this. Uh, the most common decision, which is a kind of, a, uh, so you see two extremes here represented. So on the one hand, we say we do nothing uh, and we materialize claims about conclusions uh, only uh, when uh, we need them, when we need to calculate them. Or the other extreme is we just create a full-blown separate resource <laughs> entity for them. Uh, there is a kind of a middle ground. And the middle ground would be not to create a separate resource, but to keep an attribute. Say, uh, in this case, either, uh, so we're talking in this case, so this is an example with customers. So in this case, the attribute will be in the custom, an attribute of the customer's entity. So we have to model the customer's entity anyway. And in this case, we can view this balance, which is a materialized conclusion about the residual claim against uh, that particular customer as an attribute in the customer's account. Of course, it is different from all the other attributes because it is calculated from the information which is already stored in the database. It is not an independent piece of information. And there is a problem associated with that because in the same way as we would have with uh, uh, say separate uh, resource entities, uh, there would be a possibility for this to get out of sync. So we would have to be careful about uh, adjusting the values of those attributes to make sure that the information doesn't get out of sync. Okay, so there are a number of modeling decisions uh, that can be made uh, when we uh, decide how to, uh, where, when and how to materialize conclusions uh, about claims and resources, okay? So similarly, let's say uh, we want to material, we talk about materializing conclusions about resources. So what would be an example of that? Uh, let's say you are talking about a particular type of a good, right? A particular shovel. Uh, you, you are a retail store. You keep selling that shovel and from time to time you get shipments from your vendor, right? Where you resupply uh, your inventory of shovels, right? Uh, what would be a conclusion materialization? The conclusion materialization would be quantity on hand. 
uh, of that particular shovel. So what do you do about it? So at one extreme, as we discussed before, uh, you can calculate it when you need it because you have records of all the shipments of shovels to the customers. You have records of all the deliveries of shovels from the vendors that manufacture them. You also have records of when customers returned shovels or shovels were broken and they were actually scrapped. Uh, so you, you, if you aggregate all those records of events, you will calculate the quantity of shovels you currently have on hand. And this will be an example of conclusion materialization. And at one extreme, you can say, well, so there is no reason for me uh, to keep that piece of information in the database. Because since it is derived from the other information in the database, it is independent and may get out of sync, which is dangerous, right? I don't want to have contradictory information in my, in my system. On the other hand, you can argue, well, yes, you can calculate it, but you often need to know what it is, how many shovels of this type you have on hand. And if you keep recalculating it over and over again, you will just slow down your system without uh, good reason. So it may be better to add this attribute, quantity on hand, to your inventory table with the understanding that this is a derived calculated attribute and you need to have certain procedures in place to adjust its value to make sure that you don't create a contradiction in your system. Again, this is a conclusion materialization decision that you make at this modeling stage and it will re really depend on your understanding of what kind of operations you want to get out of your system. Any questions about this? So, and, um, um, so in the modern uh, enterprises, um, when, for example, when you look at the example of Oracle or SAP, um, I saw uh, some examples that companies would keep like duplicate. Uh, they do. Or, uh, so some something that is like extra, um, uh, like to match the di different ratios or something from management accounting, those. Um, yeah, yes, they do. And strictly so, speaking, again, that's a modeling decision. So if you extend this, if you extend the logic of what I just discussed and uh, actually related to the question that Andrea asked earlier, then you know pretty much the same applies to the balances of general ledger accounts. So what are the balances of the general ledger accounts? If you uh, ignore for a second uh, that in some cases you have to also do estimates, right? As in the form of your adjusting entries that are required, uh, let's say by, by the accounting standards that you use, right? So for example, in this case, when we are talking about accounts receivable, I was cheating a little bit uh, when uh, I was saying that you just do this aggregation and you calculate what they are because there are financial statement pronouncements that tell you that you are required to recognize the fact that uh, in some cases you will not be able to collect on your receivables. So therefore there are requirements for the so to take the so-called provisions for uncollectable receivables, right? And, uh, and that balance should be reduced and it all depends on the so-called aging of accounts receivable, right? So you took financial accounting, you all studied it, right? So you know, 
If it is 30 days overdue, it becomes suspicious. If it is 60 days overdue, well, doesn't look good. If it is 90 days overdue, we'll probably never collect it or something like that. Or maybe we will be able to sell it for 10 cents on the dollar. Whatever, I mean. But uh, I was ignoring all that, right? So if we ignore for a second that requirements for certain accounting estimates, okay, and that's a separate thing that goes a little bit outside uh, this modern paradigm, then balances of the general ledger accounts are all conclusion materializations, right? And then the question comes whether you need a general ledger at all in this event-driven accounting information system. And one can argue that theoretically speaking, the answer can be sure, why not? We, we can get by without it because when we need those balances, we can calculate them. We can do this conclusion materialization. Computers are fast. We can do this, right? Now, this is just another example. You know, there are plenty of jokes about the difference between theory and practice. And uh, uh, this is just another example of that. So in theory, we don't need the general ledger. In practice, all modern accounting information systems have general ledger tables. But it doesn't change the fact that the balances on those accounts are derived values. And therefore, special provisions have to be made to make sure that there are no contradictions and they are materialized correctly. So it is still a conclusion materialization thing. That is uh, unavoidable because that is the substance of what is happening here. Okay? Again, I don't... So, uh, uh, Alexander, going back to your question. Uh, if you look at the, say, Oracle or SAP inventory table, will you see quantity on hand there? Yes, you will. If you look at the customer or vendor uh, records, will you see the balance field in those records in our modern ERP system? The answer is yes, you will. But it the, doesn't change the fact that those are examples of conclusion materializations. And you have to put separate procedures in place to make sure that those conclusion materializations are maintained correctly. Right. And it usually requires, uh, like, specialists to decipher those things. Yes. Well, I can tell you that uh, the primary uh, consideration is uh, the frequency of use versus the frequency of change. So if something is changed infrequently, but is used often, then that's a typical situation where you will actually uh, maintain those materialized conclusions. So you will put them in, you will keep it in the database. Okay, other questions? Okay, so to make sure that our information is consistent, that we don't create contradictions, uh, what kind of procedures we can use uh, to maintain uh, consistency? So here you see this exhaustive enumeration. And, uh, uh, and they are basically partitioned into two categories. Uh, on the left, you have the uh, column where you have the procedures where conclusion materializations are in the database. So meaning that they uh, affect the so-called based objects. It's like, say, in the customer's uh, record, we have the balance field, okay? So that uh, on the right-hand side, uh, you have the procedures where uh, you don't do this. So you don't make any changes to the base object. So in this case, 
the customer's record will not have the balance field. Okay? So these are the two columns, the left and the right. And then uh, you have the categories of procedures where you do it instantaneously or you do it periodically. Okay? So when you need it. So in the case of, uh, uh, say, the customer's balance, if you want to uh, maintain consistency instantaneously, you have to use the so-called triggered procedure. Uh, so what does it mean? It means that whenever you create records of events that would affect this particular conclusion materialization, a procedure has to be triggered to adjust it accordingly. Okay, now uh, at the time when this paper was written, people were talking about triggers in databases, inside databases. So it is indeed possible that you can create uh, triggers in on relational tables. So uh, any uh, relational database allows you to define a trigger. Uh, let's say on the shipment table or on the cash receipt table so that whenever a record is created or modified in that table, a procedure is triggered to update the balance uh, on the customer's account. Uh, so at the time of writing this paper, the thinking was that this is where the triggered procedures will be implemented. Now, later on, people realized that uh, if you put a trigger on a transactional table in a high volume relational database, uh, it will kill the performance of the database. You actually, you cannot do it even today, even with the uh, modern processing capabilities. So the way it is done today, the trigger procedures are impl implemented at the so-called application layer. So modern enterprise systems are three-tier or multi-tier systems. They are not two-tier systems. They are not just a database and an interface, but there is a separate layer, which we call the application layer, where all the business logic is implemented. And in our modern architectures, those are separate computers. They are not uh, on the same computer that runs the enterprise database. Uh, so, and those are designed in such a way you can do it there. So you can actually, so in, in this modern multi-tier enterprise uh, architecture, you actually would do these triggered procedures above the database to shield the database from the severe computational penalty. Now you can also uh, uh, mitigate this computational penalty by making these adjustments periodically uh, instead of instantaneously. Again, uh, so at the time of the writing of this paper, uh, it meant that instead of triggers, you would use the so-called stored procedures, again, in the database. Uh, still, uh, our databases have this capability. So you can create a piece of code and keep it as a stored procedure that you run periodically on a schedule in a database. And nowadays, again, people wouldn't do it uh, in the database itself. They would do it above it uh, at the application level, at the level of business applications. Or you can just do the calculations, either with this, this define the so-called views Again, the terminology which was at that time synced with uh, relational database management systems, a view is basically a stored query uh, that will generate a result set on the fly. So, and it can do calculations. Or you can do derivation procedures again, uh, basically store procedures that you run periodically, right? But without actually changing anything in the customer's record. So this is an exhaustive, uh, discussion of all possible ways of how you maintain uh, consistency while, uh, say, materializing conclusions through different means.
questions. Again, all these things still apply. As I say, some technological implementation details uh, would differ nowadays compared with what was the state, let's say, 35 years ago. <clears throat> okay, uh, so what are those uh, various decisions uh, that you have to make? So I already said that you can actually decide that certain claims can be treated as base objects, for example, accounts receivable, accounts payable. Uh, and But then uh, you actually, you uh, go full Monty. So you have to do all these inflows, outflows, have separate events for that, uh, have duality there. So uh, uh, do it in that way. Often this is not done. People uh, prefer to deal uh, some kind of this intermediate solution uh, that I just discussed. Now, uh, uh, summation of uh, economic event data over time. Now, that's another uh, interesting aspect. So if you start analyzing the meaning of, I present, what, of what I just presented to you, then you should be able to identify an implicit assumption that was made in my presentation that we maintain a complete detailed record of business events from the beginning of times forever. Okay? So whenever this business starts functioning, uh, we just capture absolutely everything of relevance and we keep track of that and we have access to it forever, okay? Then we can do all these aggregations and calculations that I just discussed. Then there is no problem indeed. Theoretically, that's correct. Now, the reality that we are still facing is uh, our finite storage capacity and the cost of storage, even though it keeps going down, uh, but you know, this information only keeps growing. Uh, so the reality of practice tells us that this is not going to happen like that. Indeed, we have uh, certain requirements in place, let's say with respect to document retention. Uh, I don't know your extent of familiarity uh, with the relevant uh, law in the United States, but let's say uh, the current interpretation of Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002 is that you have to maintain uh, business records for seven years. Uh, and uh, so that's a significant duration of time, but uh, what about beyond that? Well, the reality is that the enterprises actually uh, may not trash those records, uh, but they will not pay for real-time operational access to all that old data. So what they will do is archive it. So there is this term that refers to the migration of all the business records to much cheaper and much more voluminous and much slower storage, which is still the case, okay? <clears throat> now, in terms of what does it mean to our uh, application? So it means that in case of certain economic events, what will remain in the operational access to us is just certain aggregations of old data over time. So basically I'm talking of what accountants call beginning balances, if you wish. Okay. Now it is somewhat more than a beginning balance because we are talking about much more detailed records. 
Okay, so there may be aggregated information about some other aspects which may not be even uh, may not be even monetary measures. It may be certain non-monetary measures, but there will be still this uh, certain aggregation over time uh, that uh, remain remains available to us because uh, it is not feasible to maintain fast operational access to very old data. Okay. Now, what else? Partitioning and combination of economic events. Okay. Uh, so what is this? Well, uh, in some, well, you know what, let us, there are examples in the chapter. So let me just do this. Okay, so, so some examples. So this uh, base objects. Okay, so as I said, uh, I, I, I already explained this. So if you decide to go this route, you just go full Monty. You uh, do the separate economic events, inflows, outflows, all the necessary relationships. And again, you do it only if there is a specific reason to do this. Okay, in some cases there is, but usually you don't. Now, this temporal summation means that uh, you actually, you have to do this cost-benefit analysis. So when, what is feasible for you to, rem to maintain in your operational st uh, storage? And uh, whatever is archived, you just create and uh, keep the summary information. Okay, so let's talk about event combinations. So I wanted to get to this slide uh, because instead of just trying to explain it verbally, uh, it, uh, it is uh, uh, a very, very uh, good uh, example, okay? So uh, let's say uh, that uh, to run your business, you actually have to utilize uh, the services of an advertisement agency, right? You have to inform your prospective customers about your products and maybe entice them to buy them, right? So it's very important for the operations of your business. So uh, what, what is happening? Well, uh, what everybody knows you will see is that you will get certain bills from that advertising agency and you pay them, okay? So there will be this cash disbursement event, right? That will, by the way, decrement cash. And you know that it has to have a dual. You remember we talked about duality. Uh, okay, so it has to have a dual. So what is the dual of this event? Well, in this case, the dual of this event would be the acquisition of advertising service, right? So this is the bill uh, that you get from the agency. So you have this event. You acquire this advertising service, great. So this is a dual, but as a dual, it has to be an economic event, meaning that there has to be a resource which is increased by this acquisition of advertising service. What kind of a resource is that? And the only answer you can give is that the resource that you require, obviously, should be called advertising service, right? So if the event is acquiring that service, so what are you acquiring? You are acquiring this service, right? So the principle of duality tells you that this is an economic event and there has to be this resource that it looks like you failed to model explicitly. You see the dotted lines, right? So the dotted lines show something that our conceptual schema typically will not include. Uh, okay, so this logic tells you, yes, we are acquiring this resource. So now we have a resource called advertising service. And we have an inflow from advertising service acquisition. Now is the time to recall that we have that second principle that tells us that for every resource, we should have both inflows and outflows, right? Every resource as a stock level must fluctuate. 
up and down, right? It cannot increase or decrease only in one direction. So if we have an increment event, this inflow from the acquisition of advertising service, there must be a decrement event, right? Which would be the consumption of this advertising service, right? So that's the outflow, okay? So, but if there is this outflow consumption of this advertising service, this is an economic event consumption and it must have a dual, right? What would be the dual of this event? So when we consume advertising service, what do we get in return? And the answer here is the only thing that we get in return is sales. So this consumption of advertising service, so we actually, we decrease our resource of advertising service, right? So we have to increase something, right? So in that case, this will be the increase due to sales, basically eventual uh, collection of cash, I suppose, right? But that might, would make sense to do only if there was a way for us to attribute certain ads to certain sales. And if we cannot make this attribution, then this whole discussion is completely pointless. And you know that some companies actually attempt to do this. When you buy certain things online, I assume that from time to time, you encounter a situation where the seller tries to ask you a question. How did you hear about us? Or something like that, okay? So this is what they try to do. They try to attribute consumption of advertising to certain sales. In many cases, this is not feasible. People assume that that advertising is useful, it results in something, but they cannot actually make those attributions directly. So therefore, these details that are shown here in the dotted form are not modeled explicitly. It doesn't make any sense. It's like trying to allocate electricity consumption to your different offices, trying to differentiate between people in the showroom, people in the warehouse, people in the accounting department to see how much electricity is consumed by each one of those. Even if you learn that, so what? What are you going to do that to in, uh, incentivize those people better to turn out the lights? Most likely you're not going to do this, right? So there are certainly, this is where the uh, uh, modeling stops. And again, this is this event combination is one of those decisions so that you have to make where you can stop. Okay, so we get a bill from the advertising agency. We acquired uh, that advertising service full stop. Okay, we are not going to expand this economic event modeling any further. We will collapse all those dotted things into this and stop here. Same with electricity. We may not even create a resource called electricity in most cases, if we are not gonna track a uh, separate consumption of it by different parts of the enterprise. Any questions here? Uh, Professor, I have one question. I'm so confused about this graph. And so when you are meaning that the increasing um, economic events, does that mean that increasing expense in this case? Well, you are struggling because uh, you are trying to make a clean map of what you discuss into the standard accounting terminology and it doesn't map. Okay, mm -hmm. so as far as we are concerned, so there are 
inflows and outflows of resources. Okay? I don't even use the terms of revenue and expenses, right? That will come later when uh, you want to apply certain accounting principles and rules to this complete record of business events. You know that under different accounting jurisdictions, there are different rules for what is considered an expense, okay? And different principles of matching expenses and revenues. So if you want to do accounting according to GAAP, or you want to do accounting according to IFRS, there will be somewhat different rules about what you categorize as what. There may be differences in revenue recognition rules, right? The system that I am presenting here is agnostic in the sense that it doesn't care about those differences in accounting rules and regulations, because all that would matter only when you do those accounting estimates and do conclusion materializations based on the detailed uh, records in this system. So the only objective is to maintain complete, unfiltered, disaggregated records of business events. And those records uh, are neutral in the sense that they don't depend on any accounting rules. The accounting rules kick in at the next step. When you want to calculate accounting numbers on the basis of these complete disaggregated unfiltered records. Did I answer your question? Uh, yes, pretty much. Thank you. Other questions? I want to ask the application of the REA model. Um, so this REA model are you, is used to create the database or the account information system? Yes. So this is the conceptual model, which will be translated into a database schema of an ERP system. Oh, okay. Uh, the second question is about the second paper. And the second well, paper. Well, I'll get there. Oh, okay. I am not going. By the way, I noticed that the syllabus says that the second paper is optional. Actually, I want all of you to read it. And I intend, I will use a part of the next lecture uh, because I believe that I can cover uh, design science faster to cover the most important things from the second paper. Because I believe that this uh, policy infrastructure, this REA approach towards modeling the policy infrastructure of enterprise systems is also critically important. So I will get to the second paper. I'm not going to abandon it. Okay. By the way, just my final remark about this. So what I said about GAP and FRS, <laughs> that as far as the information system is concerned, there is no difference and no change. So this modeling works for a truly global corporation. Uh, if you want to do accounting according to GAP or you want to do accounting, let's say, according to IFRS, it would necessitate creating two separate sets of reports based on the very same system. So the system and the records will not change in any way because they are just detailed, unfiltered, disaggregated records of business events. But then when you need to generate the actual accounting numbers in according with the accounting rules and regulations, that will be done by means of this derivation procedures. It's a kind of a conclusion materialization exercise. And that will require two separate procedures because rules differ. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, 
another thing, this uh, macro level duality, right? So, uh, so what happens? As I said on the previous slide, so you actually can attribute uh, this uh, advertising service construction uh, to a cash receipt. You see, it says it is related to sale. In the same way, there are other accounting concepts. For example, we have the concept of depreciation, right? So our buildings depreciate, right? Because uh, they become old and need to be fixed or will need to be replaced sooner or later. So again, uh, technically speaking, we can try to measure depreciation. You should remember a discussion about the difference between the so-called economic depreciation and the counting depreciation, right? Economic depreciation is a real thing that a change of, of value uh, in value of certain resources. The problem with the economic depreciation that in many cases, it is impossible to measure, right? So therefore accountants resort uh, to the so-called accounting depreciation, which is basically a set of somewhat arbitrary rules, right? You can have the so-called straight light depreciation, or you can have certain uh, accelerated depreciation rules, you know, like double declining balance or some of the years digits or whatever those accelerated depreciation methods uh, you studied in your accounting classes. Uh, it doesn't matter, but basically what happens is that there is this uh, economic reality that uh, as a result of these economic events, there is a change of value in the building, right? So there is this outflow. So it means that there is this duality with the cash receipt. And the thing is that in most cases, you see the dotted lines, it means that we will not model it explicitly because there is no good way for us to do a direct attribution, let's say, of a change in the value of the building to a particular sale that took advantage of that real estate, of that building, okay? And since we don't have a good way of making this attribution, we are going to ignore that, even though there is this hidden uh, economic reality of duality underneath. Is this any questions about this? Okay, I have one slide left, which is just a very brief summary of future. I know, by the way, I, I keep watching the clock. Uh, I realize that I'm out of time, right? So uh, yeah. let me just uh, very quickly complete it. So uh, again, uh, it's very interesting. So there is this future research section in the paper, and it talks about a number of very important modeling issues. And some of them are striking because keep in mind, this paper was published in 82. The next paper is uh, I am going to cover uh, was published in 2006. So this 82 paper talks about the extension of REA models to uh, budgeting, say commitment accounting, uh, and uh, using REA for inter internal control specifications. And this is basically the primary topic of the second paper. Okay, that I, as I said, I will cover it uh, next week, so please read it. Now, again, so there are important implementation issues that were clear even at that time, like when you use declarative, when you use procedural uh, features. Uh, as a general rule, it is much easier for humans to, to learn with declarations than with the description of procedures. So our current trend is to use declarative means as much as possible, whenever we can avoid procedures. It is not always possible. Okay, so amount of redundancy, Alexander, this is what you were asking about. Uh, do we use still redundant data? Yes, we do, including for internal control purposes. That's why you see some redundant information in the ERP databases. And some other traditional needs, as I said, uh, another thing that I didn't mention, uh, theoretically, there should not be a need for the so-called general journal, but you do still see basically the equivalent of the general journal table in every ERP system. And these are com completely integrated systems these days. Again, this is a remarkable paper. I tried to cover it in as much detail as possible. Uh, 
make sure you reread it. It's one of the most important papers uh, in accounting information systems ever published. And again, read the second one uh, from the Journal of Information Systems. I will start the next lecture with the continuation of these slides. I still mm -hmm. have almost 30 more slides to cover, but I will go fast, I promise. Yeah. Any, any yeah. final questions? And again, again, I apologize for uh, running five minutes over. Okay, stay safe, be well, and I'll see you a week from today. Good.